Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to give a speech on the MICFS aid issue. I don't know how you found me because I never do this, but uh, or only in Norwegian. But I'll try and please ask uh, to uh, uh, the moderator if I say things wrongly, and I can try to explain it better. So this is a Norwegian's perspective, status 2021. The story is really evolving. A global joint effort is important, so that's why I really wanted to meet you. I've never seen anyone from the MI, uh, Irish MI Association, so that's exciting. So my name is, as you've heard, Hannah Thurmer, and I'm a medical doctor with a PhD, and I'm a cardiologist. Uh, I work in Telemark in Norway. We have a very cold weather now, minus 20 degrees and lots of snow. And I'm a specialized specialist in internal medicine and cardiology. And I also have a PhD and I have been president for the, of the Norwegian Society of Internal Medicine. And I do some local and national politics. But you're probably not interested in this, but in about what I know about MECFS. And that started in 2009. We had some very distressed parents and a child, and, or she was 13, 14, and there was absolutely nothing I or we at the hospital could do to help her. But then we thought we should try to learn more, and Aker Hospital was then the main center in Norway. We attended the course, we started up in 2010 with the outpatient rehabilitation in the group based groups of eight to 12, eight to 10 patients. And through the years that has been about 300 patients attending these courses. Then we work with the MI association with psychologists, physiotherapists, the disability service people in the national community. And I've done outpatient diagnostic consultations, probably around 1,000 patients now through these years, 1,000 individual different patients. We also offer two to five days hospital stays with more thorough workup for the difficult cases or the very sick patients. Probably maybe about 150 patients have had this hospital stay option. I also do a few home visits, but not often. I was part of the multi-center randomized control trial on rituximab and we included 34 patients in this study and they had 192 infusions and 224 other consultations through 2015, 2016 and these other consultations were different tests to try to figure out how to diagnose ME. We put them on a bicycle two days in a row we did endothelial function tests, we measured lactate and uh, did some genomics. So they were through, they really did a big, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they did a lot for the MI community in Norway and they did not receive any benefit because the study was absolutely negative. But it was good to develop more uh, knowledge. I do some disability pension declarations and insurance cases also. So that's my clinical background. I'm, I'm, I'm a clinical doctor. I'm not much into research, just a little bit. So these terms are difficult. Myalgic encephalopathy, very not very precise. Chronic fatigue syndrome, probably stigmatizing title, not the best way to describe the sim syndrome. Often we just put them together, it doesn't make it much better. Other names, neurasthenia, soldier's heart, uh, depression, cognitive dysfunction, immune dysfunction. There have been some clusters and epidemics also in Norway, associated in Norway with Guardia lamblia, it's a parasite. I think people with MI are in good company with Charles Darwin and Florence Nightingale, at least the histories of them fits very well with the MI CFS disease. And I really think the IOM term systemic exertion intolerance disease is better. It, it really uses the word disease 
And it also points to the systemic nature that it's all over the body, not in the mind. And of course, you know, this huge burden for patients and society, knowledge and research is much needed. New theories, little consensus, still no established effective treatment. And the causes and the mechanisms are largely unknown. And it's difficult to be patient in both meanings of that word, and also difficult to be a doctor in the MICFS uh, uh, part. So the general model, I think that's one of the questions I was uh, mailed beforehand also, is that the, the general model that works for many, many different diseases is that there is a predisposition of some kind, maybe genetic, maybe uh, some vulnerability. Then there's a strain of immune or other body system over time, high workloads, sleep problems, stressful relations, students having huge exams, athletics in the competitive mode, care for others over time. In my experience and my patients before they were sick really did more than most people. They were more active, they had more society things they did more than just the job and the family they were sort of very active and then there was some kind of trigger maybe infection Epstein-Barr virus is the key infection but also other diseases accidents job loss loss of relationship vaccine has been an issue some kind of trigger and the precise mechanism of the disease is unknown and when you look at all the MI patients I've seen, uh, I'm almost certain there must be subtypes, like in diabetes or in thyroid disease, that you have MI type 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe. Uh, some are orthostatic, some are uh, have gut problems, some are very hypersensitive. Uh, there must be some subdivisions, but we, do not, we don't really know much about, uh, enough about that. Uh, so this is a very general MI disease model that I use when I try to figure out and talk to patients and go through the history. And then what is fatigue? That is a key term. And it should really be divided when you ask them, or oh, do you have fatigue? Because everybody would say, yes, I'm fatigued. And there's a disability to start activity. I don't think that's usually the problem with MI patients, they start way too much activities and they start up again and again, even if they know it's not good for them. Is, it's not like a depressed person who would not start, but uh, would uh, not have the motivation, but they start things, but they can't keep it up. They lack the endurance and they also lack the concentration, the focus, the attention needed to really enjoy or fulfill or do the activity. And the next day, if they try to repeat, they have become sick or have this post-exertion malaise. If they measure lactate, they may have higher lactate levels in the bloodstream. And uh, I think it's important to try to really dig into the description of the fatigue, not just ask, do you have it? And then say yes or no. It's not visible, I don't have a measure that can measure how fatigued you are, and it must be differentiated from sleepiness, being out of shape, depression, sleep apnea, overexercise. And of course, ME, CFS is much more than this fatigue component, although that is very, very important. When you measure lactate, it looks or it's similar to overexercise in high performance athletes. Because if they do too much exercise or training, they come to a point where they produce lactate and more training doesn't help. It just makes them worse. But of course, it's at a quite different level of exercise that you have this lactate measurable. So I use a model too that everybody tired. That's the big circle. Tiredness is common in many, many uh, ordinary ways of life. And you have the burnout syndromes, you have cancer, cancer treatments, depression, rheumatoid arthritis, MS patients, they have the tiredness, sometimes even into the fatigue, that's the inner circle. 
but in my model, the chronic fatigue syndrome, now we get some Norwegian here, is sort of always in there. They never pendulate out and in from the fatigue tiredness, but they have the fatigue as the main symptom. So when you, when you said everybody's fatigued once in a while, yes, probably, but the chronic fatigue is really chronic. It's more like a permanent condition than something you have once in a while. Uh, we use this when we have these group sessions on how to avoid uh, symptom worsening by doing too much. I use the IOM Institute of Medicine models. They really did a good job in developing better diagnostic criteria, trying to find new terminology. And uh, I guess what we're doing now is the outreach strategy to update healthcare workers and update the world and plan to update the criteria that really needs to be you know, consensus based. And they also did, you know, go through 9,000 plus scientific papers. They had meetings with stakeholders, they really try to involve the patients and the physicians and the teachers and uh, try to make a consensus driven uh, process. But we are not quite there. The main messages from this report is that it's a serious, chronic, complex, multi-system disease with profound limitations of health and activity and that the full medical history and examination combined with relevant diagnostic tests to exclude other diseases is mandatory or necessary. And if you do this, it should be sufficient to diagnose MACFS. And that's what I usually do a lot of because the patients never get the diagnosis, the general practitioner is scared or unsure or doesn't want to put such a huge diagnosis on the person. So they sent to me so I can say, yes, this really fits with the criteria and I have no other good explanation for the symptom complex. But it really should not be necessary to go to some few doctors to get this diagnosis. And it should be reclassified and given a new name. In Norway, I don't know how it is in Ireland, but in Norway, absolutely not all health workers and teachers and public servants sort of believe in MI. And the well-established conditions, the visible injuries, the measurable defects are much easier to comprehend. Dealing with unknown conditions is difficult, so the professional becomes what I would call unprofessional. And they would say that this doesn't exist because I have not heard about it, or this is exaggerated, the latest indices, it's like the fibrolash or the whatever modern disease. Or somebody say, some say, this is interesting, I must study and learn more. And of course, also that this is not my business, find someone else, find another doctor, find another school, go somewhere else. And at least in Norway, this has become a conflict area. The patients and caregivers feel wronged and rejected. And there are serious insults and violations of integrity and quite the conflict level between patients and children and teachers and parents. I don't know if that's the same in Ireland, but at least it has been in Norway. You don't seem to agree. <laughs> So you have this, the 25th doctor visit, patient is very concerned, doctor feels that he can't find anything, it's a hypochondriac or I lack proof. And you go in the circle and the circle and the circle and you don't get a good di diagnostic workout. And of course we lack the tests, the objective findings, so we only have to rely on the typical signs, the classic history, the common loss of function, and hopefully uh, diagnostic tests will eventually be of a quality that they can be used in uh, uh, hospital and general practice, not just in research. But I feel I, when I get them, they have been through this circle several times and are quite uh, fed up with doctors too sometimes. So how many? Well, we don't really have very good numbers, uh, and we also have severity grades. 
probably I would say two to four with the diagnosis uh, for every thousand inhabitants. Some uncertainty here. And then you have these, at least in Norway, we use four grades. We say mild, it's still very severe disease, but they are ambulatory, able to self-care, personal hygiene, can do light home chores. Some may work and study with difficulty or part-time, but still uh, usually some cognitive impairment and they must rest weekends and evenings and uh, really plan everything to be able to do uh, part-time work. Maybe that's about half of those with ME. Then you have the moderate, little energy, must limit all activity. I usually ask you, do you have to choose between taking a shower or having breakfast, or can you do both without any rest between? And uh, many say that they haven't showered in two weeks <laughs> because they have to eat. Uh, rest much during daytime, not just evenings and weekends. Maybe at least I think about 30% of any patients. Then you have the more severe grade, unable to do simple daily tasks such as brushing teeth, severe cognitive impairment, should or would need wheelchair home assistance, really outside the house, and they must rest most of the time. And many people, so common people think that you have to be this sick to have the diagnosis, but fortunately that's not the majority, maybe 15, 15%. And then what the patient everybody's heard about is the very severe bedridden, unable to care for self, very sensitive, isolated, severe cognitive deficit. Fortunately, not many, but you don't have to be this sick to have the MICFS diagnosis. But that's you know, the TV or movie picture of MI is that you are in a dark room with the blinds over the window and you're not doing anything. But even the mild has a severe loss of function. But I, I think these numbers are approximate, but that in the study we did the gradings and it came out about like this too. Diagnostic criteria in the Institute of Medicine is easier than all the uh, Canada and consensus and Fukuda and uh, New Canada, but they have the common, and I think these are the most important diagnostic criteria, and that's the significant reduction compared to life before, at least 50%, often 80-90%. Should be some duration, six months is usually used. And the symptom and the fatigue it comes after activity is not, new and is not caused by overactivity. And you have this typical PEM, post-exertion malaise. I think it's a key issue, together with that sleep is non-refreshing. And then you have the additional symptoms, cognitive impairment or POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And many have much more than this, but this, I think these are the key, most important symptoms. And particularly the PEM, too, I really try to go into what kind of activity, what kind of symptoms do you get? Common but not obligatory findings would be pain, various types, intensity, presence, infection as a trigger, not always, but often, Gen gastrointestinal and genitourinary symptoms are common, sore throat, tender glands, hypersensitivities for noise, light, smell, temperature, touch, and sleep disturbances. But you don't have to have all of these. Many have all of these. What level of function? Uh, you really have to be concrete when you talk to these patients because they often forget how sick they are and they are very positive. But uh, do you have to choose between shower or breakfast? Can you stand upright when showering or cooking? Can you shop three things, things in the shop without, without having with a written note and get the three things you plan to get and not the other things? Do you ever go to a shopping mall? And uh, is your activity of daily living, you know, how many things can you do that 
normal people would do at home, can do the washing, hang up, hang up the clothes, make dinner, get the garbage, you know, can you do all the things or do you have to do very little and divide into small park parts before you do it? And my experience is that many patients that come to my office forget how sick they really are when you start going into the details. In Norway, you must try what we call work-related activities before you get the disability pension. Then you go to a person at the disability office and they say you have to try this and this. And many say yes to impossible activities just to get through the system. Common thing is that for men is to be put in a kindergarten setting because they always want men in the kindergarten. And that's noisy and crowded and absolutely not good for MI patients. But they say, yes, I, I can do that. And then they get really sick. In Norway, I think in most countries, there are more women, 70, 75% of MI patients. That also goes for many autoimmune diseases. It's a slight tendency to have other autoimmune diseases. If we think MI is an autoimmune disease, that's not proven, but it could be a model. They have thyroid problems, rheumatoid problems, celiac disease, diabetes, other autoimmune issues. Fibromyalgia and irritable bowel are part of the disease and support the MI side diagnosis, I think. It's not exclusion, but it's just supporting that they have the same complaints. Uh, MI patients are sensitive often to effects of alcohol and may have adverse reactions to painkillers and anesthetics. And if there's one patient group that should, at least I say so, they should be alcoholics or painkiller abuses because they have so much pain and they are often isolated and they're not working. So if any patient group should really have alcohol issues, it should be the MI CFS patients. But in my experience, there's absolutely minimal problems with alcohol because they just get sick from that too. Yeah, so you, you can't even drink yourself to oblivion or it just makes you worse. I've had some prob uh, questions about using medical cannabis, you know, Sativex, uh, nose drops or oil, cannabis oils. I have not tried it, but I, I do get the question sometimes and I would like to hear if you, any of you have experience or know patients who've had uh, effect of that. It's sort of new in Norway that you can prescribe cannabis to anybody. Special attention in clinic is the Borrelia Lyme Neurology Syndrome. So I always test for Borrelia, I do spinal taps, I try to figure out neurology if that's something else than ME. I do mesh serum cortisol measures morning and evening, make sure they have normal diurnal variation. I do a thorough autoimmune workup. I go through all the Epstein body virus uh, tests and try to figure out if there's a chronic infection of any kind, not only Epstein body virus. I do MR on the pituitary gland and the brain to make sure they don't have Addison or adenomas or things that could explain the uh, fatigue. We go through sleep hygiene, uh, mental health issues. Often a psychologist has been into the workup um, before they come to me. Um, uh, nutrition, vitamins, electrolytes, I try to measure all these electrolytes, the magnesium, the phosphates, the D vitamin 12, D vitamin. In Norway, it's dark in winter, so many people lack D vitamins if they do not take supplements. And we go through all the autonomic system, measure pulse, blood pressure, POTS, and so on. So this uh, really a, a broad examination to set the diagnosis. And usually all these things are normal that I have on this list, except the autonomic system. Uh, then we have the tests that... Uh, the, unfortunately, no big breakthroughs uh, in the study with rituximab. I, we did the genomic uh, full work. Uh, so what you do, you go through the genome of the patients and you sequence it and you try to find patterns and maybe something will come out of it, but not a huge breakthrough. 
There's been studies on red blood cell elasticity. It's not useful yet for common use in the hospital. In our study, we really try to measure this post-exertion malaise, and we really uh, put our patients through the test of bicycling as hard as they could with lactate measurements and oxygen uh, uptake measurements on Monday, and then they should do the same thing on Tuesday. And then we try to see if we could measure any of this PEM objectively. And the lactate was one of the things that was of interest and the mitochondrial function. The problem with this test is like if you had a, a chronic lung disease patient, and say, we put you into a smoke chamber and we see how bad you get, because this really makes them sick for months after, if you bicycle twice as hard as you can and you really get sick, it's sort of, it's not, if you're a doctor, that's not the kind of test you would like to have because you are really making your patients very sick doing the test. So we need to find something else. We did a paper on mitochondrial function with the interest in this uh, uh, nitric acid cycle and how, you, how the cells produce energy is really in this cycle. Uh, there's also a big interest in Norway on the gut biology, the, uh, all the bacteria you have in the bowels, and if they are not the right kind of uh, bacterial flora, that you should do something to try to change that, and that would make you better. And if it's possible to measure the mix of bacteria you have in your gut, and if that could be correlated to the severity of disease, it's a difficult the research, but it's people are working on that. It's also been a lot of interest in the, the MRI of the brain stem, stem. That's uh, where the spinal cord comes out of the brain. And if there's something with the compression of important nuclei or the top of the brain stem is not having the room it should have when you're standing up, it's also difficult to get. Uh, good normal and pathological uh, what is normal if you're standing up in an MR machine because we don't do that usually. We did studies on the endothelial function inside the blood vessels and hopefully there will be more tests that can be easier to use than these tests because these are not very uh, practical to be <laughs> to say it at least. It's the diff and uh, as a doctor, I really like to measure something, not just talk to people, but uh, uh, I, I have not found any good measures, especially the PEM would be, it's, it's probably there we should really have some objective measure to find out how bad is it. But it's not like blood glucose or any blood pressure thing, it's, uh, we don't have the scale. Prognosis, uh, that's also difficult. Usually we say that the younger you are when you start having ME, the better the prognosis is. It's still not very good. I think we used to say that children about 40% improve. I used to say that they 40% get well, but we don't know how they would have been without the MI diagnosis. So even if they function within the normal range maybe they would have been much better than what they are but at least 40 percent maybe return to a school family uh, travel within the normal range but not maybe as well functioning as they would have been adolescents maybe 20 percent improve to this within the normal range of life but still maybe not the uh, full range of what they had in in them before they get sick and the adults if you're more than 35 40 when it starts i think very few recover to ordinary work and function but i think many can improve and they can have better days and what we work with then is to stay stabilize the function to avoid the push crash uh, lifestyle and the yo-yo activity when you have a good day you do too much and then you have a bad day and you're in bed and then you have a good day and you do too much and then you go up and down too much and you're not stable and if you're able to stabilize it's possible to improve
quality of life somewhat. And what I work with in these group sessions is to readjust expectation and to reduce guilt and shame and try to say that what it is what it is. Uh, we don't have the treatment, so it has, you know, coping is what we can do instead of just trying to get well if that's not within reach. An activity exceeding your capacity makes you worse and effective treatment must eventually come, but it hasn't come yet. So for now we are in the coping symptom adjustment phase of this disease. It's like diabetes before we had insulin, uh, heart uh, angina pectoris before we could do PCIs. Yeah, you just had to cope. You didn't have the treatment. Picture is uh, uh, I forgot the name. So, uh, Florence Nightingale. I think she had the MI. Uh, treatment, mostly undocumented treatment, but uh, and we are on the symptom uh, reducing treatments. I, I don't think these are something that would cure. And might not to the cause of the disease, but it can make things a little bit better. I often try low dose naltrexone. It's an anti opioid, anti morphine drug uh, tablet, three to 4.5 milligram daily. It goes into the mitochondrial autoimmune mechanisms. I go through diet, supplements, food, food map. Uh, gut biota, coenzymes, uh, B12, uh, things can be tried, especially if you can measure low levels of anything. Intravenous fluids, uh, saline or other electrolyte mixtures has, uh, can sometimes have good short-term effects, but it's very difficult to arrange that in the home. And uh, it's sort of, I try it and I do the POTS measurements and the blood pressure and pulse and see if it has an effect, but uh, it's more like a test than a treatment. Glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, that's a uh, promising avenue of treatment, effective for some. Side effects, unfortunate. Uh, and I usually measure cortisol levels before I start anyone on these things and follow up closely. Beta blockers for POTS, that's a postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Can also be used for the more general tachycardia patients. And it just reduces pulse. It doesn't cure ME, but it can make days a little better. Gamma norm, that's immunoglobulin. Globulines, I think I missed some letters in these long words that you can give intravenously, subcutaneously. It's anecdotal, you know, out of the bed effect, but I've never experienced that. I tried it maybe 10 times and no one got better. Ampligen, that's a research drug, could be, could maybe be promising. Suramine or suramine is used for sleeping sickness. Uh, so it, it, I think that's a hype, but has been uh, tried in some connections. Abilify is promising. That's an antipsychotic drug if you give it in very small doses. Research from Stanford is one of those things that are being tried out in a scientific way. Uh, then you have the PACE study, the graded exercise therapy, the lightning process. I would say probably not. I've not seen good evidence that it's good for my patients. Rituximab was the study we did. It was very promising before we started and it's not effective. We also try small studies now on cyclophosphamide and other immunology treatments. But so far, no really breakthroughs, maybe symptom relief, symptom improvement. That's, uh, I, I hope for something that goes more to the core of the mechanism. FODMAP or food map, as we usually say in Norway, is a fermentable oligo monodisaccharides and polyols, and it's ingredients in all kinds of foods, and it has to do with fermentation in the, in the bowels and the gut system, and you have the green, that's what you should try, and the red is what you should not eat, and you have to really research this for your own 
about the it's not one diet that fits all. But I call the FODMAP or the irritable bowel syndrome is sort of the MI of the gut. And if your stomach is better, then your MI is better. And there's not, as I said, not one diet that will help everybody. So you really have to figure it out. And it uh, takes uh, patience. But some people really say that when they got found out what they could eat and what they could not eat, they got you know, five ten percent better. And that's a lot if you're a very low function. Let's see. Cognitive therapy. Now that's, uh, if you try to suggest that early in your patient or doctor patient uh, relationship, you probably don't have it anymore. But I think that cognitive therapy is helpful for most chronic conditions. I use it for heart patients where I have group sessions. Calls, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, cancer patients, and cognitive therapy can have effect on pain, sleep, anxiety, may increase activity and self-confidence, but it's not the cure for the MICFS. It, it's a help to manage the chronic disease, but it, if it helps, you should try it. Training programs that really take care not to increase symptoms are better than programs using pre-programmed increases in activity, load, intensity, or duration, no matter what. So the graded exercise therapy where you just follow your program and you don't, don't listen to your body, it just uh, makes you worse if you take care. I think that if you do any training program, you really must make sure that you do not get worse. And if you get worse, you have to decrease again, not just increase and more and more. Uh, I work with a psychologist who is into the biology of cognitive therapy. That's maybe a self-contradiction, but she or we both think that it's possible to regulate your autonomic nervous system by cognitive mechanism. It requires patient skill and motivation. And it takes time to learn, but of those who have really improved a lot it's the patients who've been able to do this i've had them being in a dark room in hos in hospital i had to whisper 10 minutes go out come back an hour later and after two weeks of this training they could you know have the light on they could sit on and in a chair talk to me could go outside a little bit it's not that they cured from me but they are functioning at a much much higher level but it takes time to learn, it's not for everybody. And that's uh, uh, what's called a polyvagal theory, and it's a biological model. And the theory is that many MICFS patients are either hyper or hypoactivated. They're not in the best activation mode, it's too much or too little, and it's uh, the yo-yo uh, the crash phase. And then this vagus nerve, that's this, sort of the centerpiece of this theory, interconnects with nuclei in the brainstem and in the ancient brain structures. And what's interesting is that this vagus nerve regulates heart rate, blood pressure, internal air with a hypersensitivity for sound, balance, intestinal activity, breathing rate. So it's sort of the common pathway to all many of these autonomic troublesome symptoms and the brain has developed from reptilian to human function and some of the old brain functions are still there and if you do these cognitive therapy sessions where you focus on training your vagus nerve to be less active or be active in the right way then you can downgrade or upgrade your internal system and you can get better and psychologists with special training do this. And there's a guy or a psychologist called Porges who's written many publications. And this is, it's not in the medical profession, but it's in the psychology and physiotherapy. And if anyone is interested, there's a, a book. And I'm into the self-regulation part of this uh, polyvagal theory. But it's not a cure. This is not a cure for MICFS. It's a, better cognitive treatment of symptoms than many other cognitive treatments. And it helps you regulate your 
activity in your internal activation. I think we 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 sh were going to do research on this, and then the COVID nineteen sort of abolished all kinds of uh, group things for us. Uh, we think my CFS has stages where usually when I see my patients, they are in the starting phase, uh, unstable stage. The perceived energy and what you use, uh, uh, how much you use, is the same. So you take all the energy you have and use it. If you have a good day, you do much, and then you get sick and you do little, and then you have a good day and you do much, and you have this uh, crash burst pattern. And then we try to go into the stabilizing stage where you do not use all the energy you have, you use 70% or less, and you try to accumulate some energy in the bank or in your envelope or in your package or whatever you use as a picture. And if you're able to stabilize for a sufficient long time, maybe a year, you can start slowly increasing your activity and still not go into the crash phase. And uh, I've followed patients now for some of them for five or ten years, and they are moving into the mobilization stage. Some of them, not all, but some, when they have really taken control of how much they can do. But it's very boring. <laughs> very boring. Uh, you say the cognitive impairment is also a problem dealing with these patients. They miss information when they go to meetings or uh, teach uh, in the important meetings. They still miss important information. They, they're not able to catch the messages always. They do not meet deadlines. They struggle with paperwork and they may give up applying for help and they should have a trusted person attending them or going with them to important meetings or things can come out very wrong. And care providers must really check out that message is understood and that uh, a response to activity is okay before you increase because people just forget. Uh, they come to my office and I ask them, as, oh, everything's fine. Yes, it went fine. And you ask the husband or the mother and say, no, this is total catastrophe. <laughs> so you really need to have someone with you. So this is uh, living within narrow boundaries, being careful, staying within tolerance levels, have someone watch you or be watched or make sure you do not go outside of the security area. As I said, boring. But if if tries it can be okay just being in the sun on your towel and you're fine instead of being in bed with pain. You know, just try to do not think about all the things you're not doing, but what you can do. And maybe that's better. The conclusion: MI complex disease mechanisms and treatments are uncertain and disputed. And at least my my they is to treat symptoms and improve what can be improved. I can't cure ME, but I can try to help improving different aspects of it. And I also say to patients, don't blame MI say, for everything. Check out if you get some new symptoms you've never had before, if something is different than it has ever been. You, you know, even you can have other diseases. It doesn't have to be MI, everything that's wrong with you. So if you have a heart attack, maybe it's a heart attack, maybe it's not MI. And if you do have medical treatment, it should be followed up. You should measure the effect. You should make sure you're tolerated drugs. And I think cognitive therapies vary in quality and effect, and you should choose wisely. And that MI associations are essential for these patients. So I'm happy that you are here. I work well with the Norwegian MI Association. <laughs> And then you said I should have a five minute break before we go into the question and answer session. My son takes fludrocortisone, I don't know if I've pronounced that properly, uh, 300 milligrams daily for POTS. Are there any long term side effects of this type of drug and any current safer alternatives? I had that question mailed to me and it said he takes it for POTS and then it says postural hypotension. But mm -hmm. POTS is not postural hypotension, POTS is uh, tachycardia syndrome. 
You also have neurally needed hypertension and you can use prildocortisone for that. But for POTS, I would use something that reduces heart rate, like a beta blocker. But these terms are often you know, not clear. And not all MI patients have hypertension, but very many have high heart rate when they stand up. And then I would do something to reduce heart rate and not to increase blood pressure. But the dose seemed very high. And if it's a child, it could also reduce the growth so that he, he doesn't grow as tall as he should become. So there are many side effects, but I would not use fluidocortisone for tachycardia. Okay. Uh, the next one then, uh, many with ME have orthostatic hypotension when they stand up, but a few, including myself, have orthostatic hypertension. Uh, my standing BP is typically 135 to 145. Uh, my seated BP is textbook normal. I have read somewhere this could be a sign of low blood volume, albeit for different reasons to what is normally found. Would appreciate your perspective and treatment thoughts. Well, now we're more into the cardiology part again. Uh, again, many MI patients really do not have hypotension or hypertension, but they have pulse or heart rate problems. And I've I do lots and lots and lots of blood pressure measurements, sitting and see, uh, lying, sitting and standing, and I found many have this pattern that they increase their blood pressure when standing, and the pulse also goes up. So I would really need both, not just the blood pressure. But again, it has to be diagnosed, it has to be measured, you have to try treatment, you have to diagnose, measure again. Uh, so this, uh, I think it, MI patients are dysregulated so that blood pressure and pulse is not normal. High, low, it's changing, it's varying, it's not uh, regulated as it should be. But I can't give an easy answer. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Is there a connection between long-term immune system challenges such as chronic stress or adverse childhood experiences that could explain the vulnerability some have to MECFS? Again, there's no clear answer. I would say probably for some, but Many MI patients do not really have all the uh, childhood experience issues or, so I think they are just as varied as all the other patients I see, the heart patients, the pulmonary patients, they have varied backgrounds, but it's not more in the MI group, I think. But probably, yeah. some, sometimes. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, this is, um, Two questions, same person, but two questions. Um, is, is magnesium beneficial to take? And is there brain damage with ME? Well, I, I measure magnesium. And if it's low, I should, uh, you should take magnesium. Magnesium is good for your muscles. And if you lack it, you will be, have less energy. But I don't think you are more the better. So if you just load up on magnesium, you would bet, you know, it is good for you. So you should really measure your magnesium levels. And brain damage, it's, uh, what, uh, I don't think MI patients are brain damaged in that they have, have low functioning levels, but it's been an issue about this brain stem uh, pathology, the myalgia, encephalitis thing, but it's not measurable with normal tests. And I find them have all the normal IQ and functional uh, levels. So it's not a brain damaged patient group, <laughs> I think. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, a doctor has suggested that I take flunarazine, oh, not, starting on 2.5 milligrams and building up to 10 milligrams over the course of three months for vestibular migraine. Oh, my God. I understand that flunazarine is a calcium channel blocker and seeing as your speciality is in cardio, what would be your opinion of this drug and its side effects? That's a calcium blocker, and if it's not the first line drug for migraine. So again, if you have the heart rate increase issue, I would try a beta blocker first because that would also help both migraine and the pulse maybe. 
if that's been tried and not effective, of course you can go to this third third line uh, try and try that. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not what I where I would start. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: Have you ever heard of a person's speech being affected, and also when a person finds it sore to speak? Yes, I think that's a key symptom in many, especially finding words, uh, fi remembering what you were about to say, finishing the sentence, and having the energy to speak long sentences if you're in the severe group. So that's common mm -hmm. in, in the sickest. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, okay, are you aware of any link between MECFS and heart disease? And also, has any study ever looked at or found a pattern between MECFS and heart disease in a particular age or gender group? I don't think there's been good studies, but uh, what we say is that MI patients have normal lifespan and they don't have any higher mortality from heart disease or cancer, but maybe higher mortality rate from suicide. So it's sort of not so much a link that it can be seen in the group level. I, I really don't think there will be good studies on this in the long time. And also the next question about atrial fibrillation, it's, yeah. I think it's difficult to do studies linking one group with a one heart uh, disease. Okay, so that covers the next question, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I have one more here. Uh, well, it's, it's in different parts. Um, Okay, what would be your advice for an ME sufferer to do or, t or take before getting the COVID vaccine? And the next part of that then, do you recommend taking NAC supplement, glutathione and CoQ10 before getting the vac vaccine, as I have read? And then is taking an antihistamine before and for several days after the vaccine recommended? That's a very difficult question. The ideal word would be that everybody else were vaccinated and the COVID issue was gone and then vulnerable patients didn't have to be vaccinated because they could not get it from anyone because the disease was gone. But we're not there and then it's much more dangerous to get COVID than not get it. And I don't think you know acetylcysteine or glutathione could really change an adverse reaction to the vaccine. So there I, I would recommend taking your vaccine if you're in the country where COVID is uh, common, because that's much more dangerous. But if you're in a place like in the telemark where nobody's sick, maybe you could just wait. <laughs> Hope yeah, for the best. Okay. Uh, Sarah, would you like to pluck something from the chat if you can find something there, please? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, there's one there from Chris. It says, I'm just after recovering from COVID and I have diabetes, type 1, depression and asthma. I am only diagnosed with, the, with a couple of months and have been diagnosed with early onset younger dementia nearly two years ago. I have noticed after the COVID, I am very tired and fatigued and mood very low. Do you think this is a relapse? I seem to get a good patch and then, and then a time when I'm quite bad and have to use wheelchair a lot. Do you have any recommendations that can help me with the tiredness relapse? Not really. I, I would think a COVID would be uh, something that really caused the uh, post-exertion malaise for a long, long time and a really bad uh, reaction. But I don't really have anything that would help. Okay. All right. Um, another girl said, uh, if, if the problem is in the, the basal uh, genelia, is it Anglia. Anglia, it, in the brain, uh, could there could there be ever a test to identify that? Uh, say it again, where the basal, what, the ganglia? Uh, the yeah, basal yes. ganglia in the brain, could there ever be a test to pinpoint that? Probably a variation of a PET scan, MRI scans, uh, function tests. Uh, you would have to pinpoint which ganglia and what that does. 
But I think some of the POTS measurement and the autonomic thing points to this area in the brain and the regulation, but it's, uh, we're not quite there that we can use it for easy test. But it's, I think there's a development in this area. Okay. Um, another question was, is there a problem with getting oxygen, enough oxygen to the brain? Not that we are able to measure. But again, if you have this lactate that you make, produce lactate earlier, even if you get oxygen, you're in the anaerobic metabolism and you make lactate when you shouldn't. It could be not oxygen lack, but the oxygen is not doing what oxygen should do. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Um, I have POTS and uh, diabetes. Have, have I a higher risk of heart attack or stroke because of that? Diabetes has, you know, is linked with the heart attack and stroke and it's important to have good control of your blood sugar and take your diabetes medication, but the POTS part is not well established. But I diabetes is a strong risk factor. Right. Um, do, 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 do. Just compliments there on your presentation and everything, everybody Thank liking you. it all. <laughs> I hope you were able to understand my Norwegian English. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Um, how high of a dose and what time of the day would you take it? Oh, okay, that must be gone for the last one. Dose or what? Must be regarding some, uh, sorry, that, that is LDN. Okay, so they're wondering what dose and what time would they take LDN? Uh, well, what, what I say is three milligrams. You start with three milligrams in three, the morning, yeah. and then you do that for at least two months before you evaluate if it's effective. If you think it's a little bit effective, you go up to four and a half. But it's supposed to be low dose. I have some patients just increasing and increasing and increasing, and then it's not the low dose anymore. Because so this the morning, yes, it's the morning you're suggesting take it, not yeah, the evening. I, I suggest morning, but morning, okay. But that's not. Uh, absolute. Some people say that they try morning and then they try the evening and they like the evening better. Uh, to me, it's okay. <laughs> and what about CoQ10? Um, what dose of CoQ10 would you recommend? No, uh, I don't know. I think that's very diff different how available it is, uh, the quality of these drugs. So uh, what's on the package? And then it's difficult because it's not like... Uh, uh, standardized. Okay, okay. There's an interesting one here. I fractured my skull when I was 19 and then ME symptoms ever since. No one has made the link. Could there be one? Now I am almost 60. Yeah, I had uh, one patient who was a soccer keeper and had many, many multiple head injuries. And maybe that was the start of it. Okay. But if you really should have a thousand people fracturing the skull at 19 and see what happens and you can't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> that wouldn't go down very yeah. well. <laughs> it could be, but it's difficult to prove. Yeah. But we, yeah. we were really worrying about the soccer player, if uh, keeper, because she had had many, many head injuries. And she got right. them afterwards. So I, I have the same with hypertension. It raises when I stand along with my heart rate. Not always, but about 70% of the time when I try the NASA stand test at home. I've just started uh, Midon, M-I-D-O-N, as was diagnosed with slightly low blood pressure following a 24-hour ambulance, oh no, uh, ambulatory test. Is that right? So we do ambulatory tests to make sure that blood pressure really is high at home because okay. they, when they come to the doctor's office, it's ho sometimes high. Okay. But uh, I think many of my patients are just not regulated. So they are high in blood pressure, low in blood pressure, high in pulse, low in pulse. It fluctuates and, uh, all the time. Yeah. So uh, it's, to me, it's common that it's not right, but it can be wrong both ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, um, let's see now, what else have we here? Have you heard of what feels like severe heart cramps? 
with palpitations. My GP said it was just muscular. Well, I would again put on a 24 hour measuring of the pulse and see many patients with them might have palpitations, have tachycardia. They can have pulse of 140 just standing up. Right. And really need treatment or benefit if you can lower the pulse. Okay, okay. Another lady was saying, uh, I was told my GP, I was told by my GP that in Ireland they had not treated POTS with a drug. Do you treat it in Norway with a drug? Well, again, I try, uh, first I measure it and I test it and then I usually try a beta blocker first. And sometimes it's the fluid or cortisone, uh, if it's a uh, lack of volume in the body that makes it, if they are hypotensive and tachycardic, then I would think about uh, Florinef. But beta blockers first. Right, right. And okay. test and ask if it helps before I continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, a lot of people saying thank you very much. Uh, yes. any, any hope of research advances given similarity to long COVID? Um, I think COVID maybe start a lot of research that would touch on the MI symptoms because now they could talk about the long COVID that um, um, fatigue after the virus infection. So maybe that will carry over to MI patients and uh, benefit them, maybe. Okay, okay. And uh, another lady was asking, does CBD oil help? Will it, will it help us? I don't know. I've, I've not prescribed it to anyone yet. It's very new in Norway that you can prescribe cannabis and I really don't want to start being the first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I it's, think we're about to uh, close now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're really, they're really getting in all their questions there. But yeah, yeah, we're probably, probably it's uh, it's eight thirty there. What do you think, uh, Declan? Sorry. Yes. Uh, maybe look at two more questions and then we'll wrap it up if that's okay with everybody. People might be getting tired, etc. Uh, okay, so there seems to be confusion between fibromyalgia and ME. Many doctors assume they are the same thing. Yeah, I think it's, uh, we say it's a 70% overlap because fibromyalgia is diagnosed by having tender points and pain and uh, fatigue. And that criteria would also fit many MI patients. So they would have the criteria for fibromyalgia. So I think it's overlapping diseases. It doesn't have a test that says this is fibromyalgia and this is ME, but both would have enough tender points and fatigue to satisfy the criteria. And I think 70% of the patients I see have enough pain to have a fibromyalgia diagnosis because I can't measure that either. It has to be just uh, tender points and Right. And is, is there different tender points for fibromyalgia than there is for ME? Uh, it's, no, not really. No, okay. Uh, I don't think it's that specific. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, most of them are just saying thank you very much. Uh, brilliant okay. talk. Um, let's see now. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, thank you. It's always interesting to hear new questions. And I will go home. And I, I'm, I am home, but I will think about them and maybe I will read more tomorrow about these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I was curious about the, um, like you were saying about the uh, treadmill tests and stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you still doing those or are no. they just so? Well, I think um, um, one center is still working on the PEM, you know, the post exertion malaise and the lactate measurements. And the, but it's not the test that is good for the patients. It's you no, know, yeah. it's really bad for them. But yeah. some really want to do an uh, effort for the research, uh, so they suffer afterwards. Right, right, yeah, so it's yeah. Interesting, the lactate part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's. It's. It is. But it's. 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 They. They do. I'd say they find a lot of them. Most of them, if not all of them, get probably fairly whacked after. Do they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, it's like putting a lung patient in a smoke chamber and see how bad they get. It's not good. Yeah. Yeah. God, 
yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, I think that's, that's everything, really. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in this evening, and especially to Dr. Thormer for uh, giving us her time and her expertise. So um, we'll, see us, we'll see you all next time, I hope. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thanks very Thank much, you very folks. much. Okay. Lovely to meet bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.